Hello everybody, hope you're doing great. I know there's a lot of violence and turmoil in the world now and our country is just really in a bad place right now, but we need to try and be peaceful. I'm trying to live a peaceful life myself. I mean, I know I'm, at, I know I'm, I'm known for an act of violence. This is John Hinckley Jr. He shot President Ronald Reagan on March 30th, 1981. I fired shots at him, which so unfortunately hit other people too. Just recently, John Hinckley Jr. spoke out on the recent assassination attempts on President Donald Trump. So please, let's just try and get along with each other and live in harmony and do the right thing and, and reject violence in all its forms. More on his statement towards President Trump and Thomas Crooks later on. For now, let's take a look at John Hinckley Jr.'s twisted reality. I worked hard to overcome my illness and, and I'm trying to give back to the world now through my music and my art. John Warnock Hinckley Jr. was born on May 29, 1955 in Ardmore, Oklahoma. From the very beginning, his life seemed to be cloaked in a shroud of darkness, setting the stage for the infamous act that would later define him. His parents, Joe Ann and John Hinckley Sr., were well-respected members of their community. John Sr. was the president of a successful oil company, but the family's outward respectability masked the troubled and turbulent world young John Jr. inhabited. John Jr. grew up in an affluent neighborhood in Dallas, Texas, but his early life was far from idyllic. Despite the material comforts, he was a lonely child, often retreating into a world of his own making. His siblings, Scott and Diane, were popular and well-adjusted, in stark contrast to John Jr., who was withdrawn and introverted. I always felt like an outsider, he later confessed, adding, even in my own home, I felt like I didn't belong. From an early age, John exhibited signs of deep psychological distress. He was known to have a morbid fascination with death and violence. His childhood diaries, discovered years later, were filled with dark and unsettling thoughts. In one entry, he wrote, I feel an emptiness inside me that nothing can fill. Sometimes I think about what it would be like to just disappear. During his teenage years, John's behavior became increasingly erratic. He struggled academically and socially, failing to connect with his peers. High school classmates remember him as a ghostly presence who rarely spoke and seemed perpetually lost in his own thoughts. He was like a shadow, one former classmate recalled, always there but never really seen. John's parents, concerned about their son's growing isolation, tried to engage him in various activities, but nothing seemed to capture his interest. He briefly attended Texas Tech University, but his time there was marked by failure and frustration. He dropped out in 1976, and his downward spiral accelerated. It was during this period that John Hinckley Jr.'s fascination with celebrity culture began to take a dark turn. He became obsessed with the 1976 film Taxi Driver, identifying deeply with the film's protagonist Travis Bickle, played by Robert De Niro. Bickle, a disturbed and lonely man, seeks to assassinate a presidential candidate to gain notoriety. The parallels between Bickle's fictional world and John's reality were disturbingly close. Hinckley fixated on Jodie Foster, a young actress who starred in the film. I had the delusion back in 1981 that by shooting the president I could impress Jodie Foster, which to me saying that now, it's it's ridiculous, but that's what I believed back then. His obsession with Foster grew into an all-consuming delusion. He began to stalk her, sending letters and poems in a desperate attempt to get her attention. I will win your heart, Jody, he wrote in one letter. I will do anything to make you notice me. By the late 1970s, John's mental health had deteriorated significantly. I was just totally depressed, totally despairing of my life. I thought I had no know where to turn. I had become totally estranged from my family. That was the worst part of it. I was totally isolated. He was prescribed antidepressants and antipsychotic medications, but he frequently refused to take them. His family, unable to cope with his increasingly erratic behavior, distanced themselves. He drifted from city to city, living off a monthly allowance from his parents, but his thoughts were never far from Jodie Foster. In March 1981, Hinckley followed Foster to Yale University, where she was a student. His attempts to contact her were futile, and his frustration reached a boiling point. It was then that he conceived the plan that would etch his name into the annals of infamy. He decided that the only way to impress Foster was to commit an act of historical significance. He chose to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. In the months leading up to the assassination attempt, Hinckley meticulously planned his actions. He bought a 22 caliber revolver and began to track Reagan's public appearances. His journals from this period 
reveal a mind consumed by delusion and despair. I am living in a nightmare, he wrote. I see no way out but to make a grand gesture. Only then will Jody see how much I love her. When did you first realize the connection between the Hinckley in the letters and the Hinckley who shot the president? Um, how many Hinckleys do you know? Did you contact the authorities at that point? No, I was contacted by them. I felt very shocked, very frightened. On March 30th, 1981, Hinckley put his plan into action. As President Reagan exited the Washington Hilton Hotel, Hinckley opened fire, wounding the president and three others. The nation was plunged into shock and horror. Hinckley was quickly subdued and arrested, his lifelong obsession finally culminating in an act of violence that would haunt the American psyche for years to come. But you're right, it's something that I, did, I don't want to remember. After his arrest on March 30th, 1981, John Hinckley Jr. was charged with attempting to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. His trial began in 1982, and it became one of the most high-profile court cases in American history. During the trial, Hinckley's defense team argued that he was not guilty by reason of insanity. They presented extensive evidence of his mental illness, including his obsession with Jodie Foster and his delusional belief that assassinating Reagan would win her affection. On June 21st, 1982, the jury found Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity. This verdict sparked a national outcry and led to significant changes in laws regarding the insanity defense. Hinckley was committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, a psychiatric facility in Washington, D.C., where he remained for decades. And I'm sorry to the Reagan family, the Brady family, the, the other families of the victims. I'm sorry to Jodie Foster. Hinckley's time at St. Elizabeth's was marked by numerous legal battles and periodic assessments of his mental health. Over the years, his attorneys filed several petitions for his release, arguing that his mental condition had improved and that he no longer posed a threat to society. Because a lot of people think if you're criminally insane, that's incurable. It's not incurable. I, I'm sitting here as proof positive that, it is, that it's curable. These requests were initially met with strong resistance from the public and legal authorities. However, in the 2000s, the court began to grant Hinckley more freedom. Starting in 2003, he was allowed supervised visits with his parents, and by 2006, these visits were extended to unsupervised overnight stays. From about 2003 until 2016, I was getting incremental steps out of the hospital. Each incremental step was heavily scrutinized and subject to strict conditions. In 2016, a federal judge ruled that Hinckley could be released from St. Elizabeth's Hospital. The judge determined that Hinckley no longer posed a danger to himself or others, provided he adhered to a stringent set of conditions. These conditions included regular psychiatric treatment, restrictions on his travel, and prohibitions on contacting his victims or their families. I think the main thing throughout my years in St. Elizabeth is that I had a relationship with Leslie DeVoe and she's the one who kind of turned me around and got me and got me out of my illness, out of my depression. It was a real relationship. Uh, we were we were, you know, engaged to be married. So it was a very tight relationship. That's kind of that I, I point to that as the main thing that got me out of my my illness. On September 10th, 2016, John Hinckley Jr. was released from St. Elizabeth's Hospital after 35 years of confinement. He moved to Williamsburg, Virginia to live with his mother. His release was met with mixed reactions, with some people expressing concern about his reintegration into society, while others believed he had paid his debt and deserved a chance to rebuild his life. I don't think he should be here. I don't think they should have released him. So forgive me if I don't have a lot of good Christian thoughts about someone who shot me and almost made my wife a widow and my three children fatherless. I was really disappointed to learn of the release of John Hinckley. Since his release, Hinckley has lived a quiet and reclusive life. He has been under the close supervision of mental health professionals and has adhered to the conditions set by the court. He has taken steps to integrate into the community, participating in volunteer activities and attending therapy sessions. He has also pursued creative outlets, including music and art. What is life like for you? What do you do? Music all day, or? Uh, just about. I have a friend who's who's my lead guitarist, and we've been jamming lately. We're, we're, we got a good little act together now, where we where we got about 20 songs that we're working on. And if I, if I can ever get a venue, we're gonna 
we're going to perform together at, this, at these venues. In July 2021, a federal judge ruled that Hinckley could be unconditionally released in June 2022, provided he continued to comply with the terms of his conditional release and demonstrated stable mental health. This decision marked a significant milestone in Hinckley's journey, indicating that the court believed he had successfully rehabilitated. If I could take it all back, I would. I swear, I would take it all back. As of now, John Hinckley Jr. leads a low-profile life. He continues to engage in artistic pursuits, particularly music, which has become a major focus for him. He has a YouTube channel where he shares his original songs and covers, and he has expressed a desire to perform live concerts. His channel has garnered a modest following, with some viewers expressing support for his efforts to rebuild his life. Hinckley has also expressed remorse for his actions in various public statements. In a 2020 interview, he said, I regret what I did. I wish I could take it all back. It was a horrible act, and I am deeply sorry for the pain I caused. While Hinckley's reintegration into society remains a subject of public interest and debate, he appears to be committed to maintaining his mental health and living a peaceful life. The conditions of his release and the ongoing supervision by mental health professionals aim to ensure that he does not pose a risk to himself or others. Since the recent attempted assassination on Trump has happened, John Hinckley decided to voice his own opinion on the situation, since he is very well qualified for it. Hello everybody, hope you're doing great. I know there's a lot of violence and turmoil in the world now, and our country is just really in a bad place right now, but we need to try and be peaceful, try and get along with each other. John Hinckley Jr.'s recent statement in response to an assassination attempt on Donald Trump reflects his desire to distance himself from his past violent actions and to advocate for peace and harmony. He begins by recognizing the current violence and turmoil present in the world, and specifically in the United States, showing his awareness of current events and societal issues. Let's have some harmony in our, in our lives, please, and try and reject violence in all its forms. I'm trying to live a peaceful life for myself. I mean, I know I'm, at, I know I'm, I'm known for an act of violence, but... Hinckley urges people to strive for peace and harmony in their lives, indicating a shift in his personal philosophy from his past actions to a more peaceful outlook. He openly reflects on his past, admitting that he is known for an act of violence, showing a level of personal introspection and acknowledgement of his actions. He asserts that he now lives a peaceful life and wants to be seen as a peaceful person, indicating his commitment to change and to promoting peace as part of his rehabilitation. I live a peaceful life now and I, try, I want to project that image of being a peaceful person. I try as hard as I can, but we need to try and get along and, and just love each other. I mean, that's the main thing is to try and love each other, love your neighbor, love yourself. By calling for people to love each other, love themselves and live in harmony, Hinckley emphasizes the importance of empathy and mutual respect. He reinforces this message with references to cultural figures known for advocating peace, such as John Lennon and Elvis Costello. And let's give peace a chance, as John Lennon said, let's give peace a chance. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with peace, love and understanding, as Elvis Costello said. So please, let's just try and get along with each other. His plea to reject violence in all its forms is a direct renunciation of his past actions and a call to others to avoid similar paths of violence. Hinckley concludes with positive wishes and a blessing. I hope you all have a good day. God bless you. Bye. Which may reflect a spiritual or moral foundation for his current beliefs. His statement can be seen as part of his ongoing efforts to rehabilitate his image and demonstrate that he has reformed. By publicly advocating for peace, he is attempting to show that he has moved beyond his violent past. Such statements can influence public perception by portraying him as a person who has learned from his past and is now committed to positive values. Though public reactions may vary, with some people remaining skeptical of his transformation, by speaking out against violence, Hinckley may hope to influence others who might be considering violent actions, encouraging them to choose peaceful solutions instead. Overall, John Hinckley Jr.'s statement signifies his attempt to distance himself from his past, promote a message of peace and love, and contribute positively to societal discourse. Comment below on what you think about John Hinckley. Should he still be locked up, or does he really deserve a second chance? Thank you for watching.